I want you to think about this. We, actually, we're so small. Tell me your name and the role that you play in education. Hi, my name is Nancy Sorensen. I'm over at the high school in the library as the assistant. Fantastic. Thank you, Nancy. My name is Martha. Uh, I'm a doctor and I work at the community. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jan and I'm the admin secretary at Long Mountain. Very good. Thank you. I work at Desert Heights as a teacher's aide. Okay. Very good. Good morning. I am Louise and I am a teacher's assistant for the SIP program at the Money Ranch High School. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Sherry, uh, student here. Okay, tell, tell me more. Well, I worked in the school of action as a secretary for 17 years and I just moved to student accounting. Oh, accounting. I thought yeah. said student encounter. Oh, and I was like, I want to learn more about that. that. I don't know what that means, but okay. Student accounting. I got it. So you're working primarily with adults now? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sherry and I work at Extended Study Fund. Administrative assistant, bookkeeper, and registrar. Very good. Thank you. Um, Janet, I'm an administrator. Okay, very good. Kim, the one on one and Alice Smith. Very good. And that's elementary school, right? Yes. Okay. From Elizabeth, and I'm transitioning from the beginning of the program at TCC back to the Oh, wonderful. That's great. Okay. And you are? Jenny Dutello, and I work at TMCC High School, and the admin is the registrar. Very good. Okay. So I want you to think about this power of connection from your realm from what you do and who you interact with. Every single one of us has a moment at the beginning of the day that we get to choose how to connect. And if you think about what you noticed about how you felt when you first came in and you hadn't yet connected and how you felt after you made that conscientious effort to connect, we feel better. And we need to remember that for our students. Why shouldn't we start every day like that in some way? So I want you to think about that type of routine in order to start the day right with all of your colleagues and all of your kids if you're with kids. I want to remind you again of the working agreements. I love that Washington County School District has a system in which everybody's on the same page. Um, usually agreements can be something that are decided together in a group. If you're working together over a long period of time, they should be decided together. These agreements are put in place in order to have a respectful learning environment for quick, brief times together, like a day that we're together here. So just please know, I want you to feel safe asking questions. Um, I want you to be able to engage in this whole fully. We're gonna be doing some analysis of some strategies around SEL and be talking about what do they mean and what do they look like in your realm of the world. Uh, open your mind to diverse views. We don't always know what our kids are carrying or what our colleagues are carrying in their invisible backpacks based on you know, their family traditions, their experiences, their abilities or disabilities. Um, and so we need to be open and have a mindset of seeking to understand. Okay, but I'll talk a little more about, a bit about that as we go. Integrate and constructing new information. I hope I'm gonna give you some information today that is new to you that you'll be able to take back with you and use. And it, again, that leads us to utilizing what you learn. Share it, um, put it out there, pass it on. Tony already reminded you of the four um, core fundamentals, right? Uh, and we are focusing specifically today on the climate engagement fundamental. There is nothing that says climate bigger and louder and better than social emotional learning, okay? So what is it? She said that I have a little bit of a different take. And the only, there, there's a reason I have a little bit of a different take. And I'll explain it to you in just a minute. But first I want to just introduce to you, how many of you know when I say social emotional learning, how many of you automatically already are aware of five competencies of social emotional learning? Some of you. OK. That's good. Good for me to know. So there are five competencies of social emotional learning, self-awareness, Self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And we're going to take time today to look at all of these. Okay, now here is the definition that Tony gave you this morning. 
SEL is a process for helping children and adults develop the fundamental skills for life effectiveness. SEL teaches the skills we need to handle ourselves, our relationships, our work, and our work effectively and ethically. Now, this is Washoe County School District's definition, and it actually is really good, I have to say. Because what I did is I created a Trujillo's definition, and the only reason I did that is because Castle's definition, the organization that really is behind these five competencies, it gets a little complicated and hard to understand. So Washoe County did a great job, I think, of making it real. Here's what, what I say about it. It's a process in which human beings feel, believe, and act in a way with each other and themselves. We gotta take care of ourselves, too. That allows them to be more open and engaged in learning and living. So that the world is a better, and I wanna add something else, and more equitable place. You hear a lot of talk about equity today. I'm sure they're doing a lot of PD or professional learning around equity. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know, and so we need to educate ourselves, okay, so that we can be more equitable. Why SEL? Why is it important? There's a lot of different research and, and studies to back it up, but what it comes down to is the heart of our kids. Eric Jensen is an author and a researcher who says this. He says, behavior that comes off as apathetic or rude may actually indicate feelings of hopelessness and despair. So here's what we know. Sometimes the kids that we have the most difficulty building relationships with, and the adults too, if we're just working with adults, those tend to be the human beings that are living in adversity. The reality of adversity every day, trying to survive instead of thrive. And so, why SEL is because with social emotional learning, we can try to see under that facade of apathy or rudeness or toughness, or whatever that person is putting out there to protect them, we can try to see under it to get to the heart truly of <coughs> who human beings are what the story is, what happened in that person's life, so that they're acting the way that they're acting, they're doing the things that they're doing. Because when we can connect with that, we can help them then to achieve. Students to achieve academically, our colleagues to be the best that they can be in their role as colleagues. So let's talk about each of them individually, okay? I just wanna make sure that you understand each competency and I will um, review these briefly, and then at the end, after we review all of them all, I wanna go through some strategies for each of them in, in your realm of influence. So self-awareness is this. It's identifying one's emotions. A lot of times, kids will be upset, but they can't actually put words to what they're feeling. Little kids especially. Older kids can put words to it, but they don't want to, because they don't want you to know. Does that make sense? So identifying one's emotions, having an accurate sense uh, or self, uh, a sense of self-perception. People that are my age, I don't know, do anybody, any of you have kids that are like in their mid-20s? Mid-20s, okay, so we're in this together. <laughs> many adults today and many kids today, because the kids today, their, their parents tend to be our kids. They don't have an accurate sense, sense of self-perception because we messed up. We, literally, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, we wanted them to have a high self-esteem. We wanted them to feel good all the time. My husband calls it the everyone gets a trophy catastrophe. Yes. Think about it, right? We didn't want our kids to feel bad. But in that, we didn't really help them to know that being, like having self-efficacy, that means knowing what my strengths are, but also knowing what my challenges are, where my weaknesses are, what, where I need to work and improve. Because all oh, our kids were great. Well, if you're great all the time, get a trophy, just my son, this was him in soccer, that looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> You know, and the ball's going right by him. 
Now, my husband was a very competitive athlete, and he's like, there's no trophies for, you know, looking at clouds. We wanted them to feel good. So, and I'm not, I mean, you could agree with me or disagree with me, but one thing I think that we can agree on is that kids have got to experience failure. They've got to know that sometimes they've got to work harder to get what they want, or they need to try again. And self-efficacy does that or explains that. We also talked about Michaela. Our kids sometimes can't recognize what their true strengths are. Sometimes we have to help them with that, okay? So I'm going to show you a little clip that I think really tells us a lot about self-awareness. this whole 
whole universe is a nice thing. <laughs> that little ring. And now they want me to bundle it up. It makes me so mad. <laughs> I love that. I love Seinfeld, but I love George. It makes me so mad. Why should I have to bottle it up? He started with, the whole universe is against me. A lot of our kids, especially teenagers, but a lot of our kids, their world is all about them. And some of it is because of the thing I talked about before. We did that to our kids in some ways. They can only see what their needs are. They have a hard time sometimes seeing outside of that. What is the ripple effect of how they act and what they do? What's an impact on other people? They don't think that way. So sometimes it, it is up to us to help them to see outside themselves. When they can see outside themselves, when they're called to be cognizant of the impact of their behavior on others, they may be better able to control their behavior, if that makes sense, to regulate their emotions. A lot of kids don't have that ability uh, for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's a matter of experience, okay? If you just think about this, kids today and adults today tend to get what they want immediately. It's at our fingertips. We have what, I, what we want. We don't, like, like if my husband's family, it's all these boys and, and their wives and their kids, and we'll be at a, a family event, and they're all very smart, and they like facts. And somebody will ask a question, and instead of like talking about it, trying to come up with the answer, everybody pulls out their phone to find the answer, to get the best answer, the fastest, the first. Like, I love the conversation. Now, I'm not as smart as all of them, but also, I like trying to figure things out together, right? But we all have whatever we want at our fingertips. Amazon, get what I want. Now you can get your groceries there, boom. Just drive and pick them up. We can all get what we want immediately. But there is something to be said about delayed gratification. Because when we delay gratification, it helps us to learn to control our emotions. Okay? We were, you're going to think I'm crazy. I, I don't usually share this in a presentation, but I'm going to share it with you. My husband grew up very, um, he was a, a family of five boys. Dad was a, a high school teacher. Mom stayed home with the kids. Hispanic family, they didn't have a whole lot. Um, trying to five boys in five years, I should say. So there's a lot of demands financially. And um, so he really believed, and I didn't necessarily grow up that way, and so he really believed in our kids working for things and waiting for things and learning in the way that he learned. And so I thought he was crazy when he said, I don't want our kids to chew gum until they're like six or seven. It's like, really? It's like, yeah. So we didn't let our kids chew gum until they were seven. And our son was a big deal. He's the oldest. He doesn't know any different, right? But our daughter, she was little, and Corey got to chew the gum. And Mom and Dad were chewing gum. She would say, can I have the wrapper? And she'd take the wrapper and she'd smell it. <laughs> Just smell it. And she loved the smell of gum. And I will tell you what, on her gum birthday, it was the biggest deal because she got something that she'd been waiting for. And people might think it's crazy, but now all my cousins, they have a gun birthday too, you know? Because to delay something, that you, it, it creates excitement, but it also helps us to manage what we want and what we need and know that sometimes we need to be patient, okay? Um, we can teach things at school that will help support kids in life handling emotions so that they actually foster or facilitate what we want, what we need, rather than hinder it. Think about a kid that throws a fit about a grade and blames a teacher and comes undone and ends up being sent to the principal because of their behavior. So now not only do they have an F, but they're in trouble. But if instead that kid knew to take three deep breaths before he opened his mouth 
because what might come out might not be helpful. And then wait and talk to the teacher after school and explain the situation, whatever. Maybe you'll get another chance, or maybe at least the teacher can give the kids some tools to improve that grade the next time, you know? We want kids to be able to facilitate or help the task at hand, not hurt it, okay? Another part of self-management is learning how to set goals and achieve them. So in your realm of the world, whatever you do with kids, can you think of ways that you can help them to work towards a little goal? Whether it be a behavior goal on the, on the playground, something in the classroom, in the office, something that they can do and work towards and achieve. All right, social awareness. Social awareness is about empathy. Does anybody know the difference between empathy and sympathy? Maybe you want to give it a try? Yeah. All right. So uh, so sympathy would be like, I'm, I'm not in your shoes, but I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that way. And empathy is like you're trying to stand in the other person's shoes, or maybe you have before, and consequently you understand it differently. Yeah. Or, or come closer to being on the same page with them yeah. um, and feeling what they feel rather than being detached from them. Yeah. Your key word is you're with them. You are so with them. Sympathy says, I'm sorry, for you? Mm -hmm. Sympathy sometimes says, well, at least, like you try to minimize it, well, at least you have this, at least you have that, when you're sympathetic. But empathy says, I am here with you. Sometimes it, it says I'm here with you because I understand I've been there too. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be there without telling your own story because you don't want to take away from the person you're being there with. You know? But sometimes, some of my most powerful moments with kids was when I could say, you know what? I have no idea what you're going through. I have never been there, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here with you, and I'm going to feel this with you all the way through. Like, I don't get it, but I want to understand because I care about you, and I'm here. So I'm with you. That's empathy. And if we can teach our students to have empathy, to be able to step into someone else's shoes, we can help them to be more kind and accepting and loving and understand someone else's ways of being, family traditions, cultures. Some of our kids in society, in society today hear, overhear things that are very judgmental and really hate-filled. We have this incredible opportunity in schools to start from a place of love and acceptance and empathy as opposed to hate. You know, I, I talked in the keynote a little bit about the difference between love and fear. I think about the other opposites, love and hate. How do we come from a place of love? How do we appreciate diversity? The difference is just different. It's not less than. In so many ways, it's more than. When we put our differences together, all of our different strengths together, we are more than. We need to help kids to understand that. We need to provide opportunities for kids to, they call it perspective taking, but to be able to take someone else's perspective, see through someone else's eyes. Sometimes, we try really hard to teach empathy when for some kids, especially little kids, it's pretty, um, it, it, it's just intuitive. Here's a good example.
kids just get it. But we as adults and sometimes older kids, we bring some of our experiences, our biases into the things that we do. You hear in education a lot this term cultural competence. And here's what I think. You can agree with me or disagree with me, but I think that none of us will ever be culturally competent about someone else's ways of being. Like, I believe in the term cultural humility. I need to be able to be humble enough and vulnerable enough to say, I don't understand. Please help me. Help me to know what you're thinking or what you're feeling or why you do what you do. Tell me more about it. That's cultural humility. There were times as a principal that I know I offended a parent, but I didn't know why. Because maybe something I did or in my way of being, it compromised their way of being. I've got to ask the questions in order to open lines of communication and better support the student or the family. OK, any other questions or any questions about empathy? Because that's such a big one. We'll talk about when we look at strategies, what that looks like in your realm, what you do because I think it'll be helpful to learn from each other. Relational skills. When I said our collective belief in our students and in the impact that we have on their achievement, that that's the number one indicator of success, that collective belief looks like relationship building. Because if we don't build relationships with each other and with our students, it's really hard to be on the same page together, to support each other, to encourage each other, to believe in each other. So relationship skills is of utmost importance. Really under this competency, what it looks like is building and maintaining relationships with all people. We said all of our kids are all of our kids. All of our colleagues are all of our colleagues, too. And you know what? Some of them we don't like, and some of them we might not even <coughs> understand. But they're still our colleagues, and they're still our kids. So what can we do to build relationships with them that are positive? That's what this competency looks at. How do we communicate with them in a way that grows relationships? that helps us to express what we need or what we desire in a way that's respectful and kind, that reduces conflict. There's something, have you guys learned anything about restorative practice? There's something called restorative practices, and I know that Washoe County um, has some trainings on them, so if you can ever get in a training on restorative practices, it's really about how to resolve conflict and discipline and work with each other in a way that builds trust and is um, restorative, restores relationships rather than punitive. Okay. The, the reason relationship skills or a focus on it, an intentional focus on it is important is because sometimes we tend to see what we are looking for. Okay. And, and especially if you work with kids, um, but I guess this would be true of adults as well, but especially if you work with kids, you might see in a student what you've heard about them coming up, right? Like maybe, God bless you, maybe you're a paraprofessional working with fifth and sixth grade, and all the fourth grade parents are telling you about this kid that is really tough. God bless you. And so that might be, that tough is what you're looking for. You might be a bus driver who has had the, the older siblings in class, and they're a handful, and they're always behavior issues on your bus, and that younger kid's coming, and you're going to be waiting for that kid to act just like his older sister or brothers or her older sister or brothers. Okay, so I, I think sometimes what happens is we see what we're looking for. Here's what I mean by that. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make?
The answer is 13. Somebody got it. But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> Watch again! with people. What are we expecting to see? Because in colleagues, especially those ones that drive us crazy, if we're expecting what drives us crazy, that's what we're going to be drawn to first. Same thing with kids. If you had a rough day with a kid, one of the things that my kids loved about our school is it was their second chance. And we had to work intentionally to make sure that not only the school experience was a second chance, but that the everyday experience was a fresh start. That, again, doesn't mean that I didn't believe in consequences. I was a firm disciplinarian, and my teachers were too. But still, that hope for a fresh start really can renew people, students and adults alike. That's a cyclist commercial, by the way. Isn't that a great commercial? <laughs> We've got to remember to keep, when we look at relationships, the context of need. We've got to keep that in our frame of mind, OK? When you're working with little kids, to think about the difference between talking to them like this and talking to them like this. This says, I'm in charge. And not that you're not. We need to still maintain that authority. But this says, going back to empathy, I'm with you. Talk to me. Tell me more about what you're thinking. You know? We need to think about seeking to understand what I said before in regard to cultural humility versus cultural competence. I've already defined that. But humility is, people look at humility and vulnerability sometimes as a weakness. It's an incredible strength to be able to say, I don't know what I don't know, and I want to learn from you. Not only do you empower the person you're seeking to understand from, but you do learn yourself. So it's imperative that we are culturally humble. And then we've got to always remember the invisible backpack. This, this is anger, frustration, but there's a story behind it. If we're going to build a relationship with this kid, we need to find that story. And the only way to find that story is to build a relationship with the human being that is five. You know? A lot of times we get caught up in what we're doing and we don't think we have time to build relationships. It's that walking by someone saying, hi, how are you, and keep them going because what I have over here is really important and I don't have enough time. Has anybody felt like that? I don't have enough time to do what I need to do. It's a common feeling, right? I love this clip. Because when I actually time this clip, it's one minute and 18 seconds out of this teacher's day. So as you watch it, I want you thinking, in your realm or role of education, what could you do that would take only one minute and 18 seconds that could better build relationships? Here's what this person does.
you think that that teacher has less classroom management issues than a teacher who doesn't take time to do that? I know that was a double negative, but you know? The time that it takes is very little. Now again, don't touch kids. They all say don't hug kids. You notice that a few kids, she did a side hug. So you got to know the comfort level of your kids. you got to know what's appropriate. I saw another clip like this where the teacher had the students greeting each other. And on the wall, I don't know if any of you saw this. It was going on Facebook or something. But on the wall, it said there was a, a knuckles, a high five, and a handshake on the wall. So there was a student greeter, and then the teacher greeter was behind. And as the students came up, they touched, this was a little group of kids, they touched the greeting that they wanted. So they got to choose, you know, max, high five, or handshake. And then the student greeter did it, and the teacher greeter did it, and then they went in the classroom. But what that acknowledgement in regard to relationship building says is, I see you. I'm here with you. I see you. It doesn't matter what it is or how you do it. Giving kids the autonomy to be able to choose themselves is a pretty cool thing, which leads us into responsible decision making. There are all sorts of sorts of, of ways that we can help kids to make decisions, starting with really little things, like choosing your greeting in the morning. So responsible decision making is all geared around problem solving effectively. And I prefer the term solution finding effectively. We're looking for something problem. We don't want to highlight, I, I'm sorry, we're looking for something positive. We don't want to highlight the problem. We want to highlight the solution. How do we work together to find a solution? And in fact, that working together is an offer but we want to provide opportunities, regardless of our realm, for kids, but for adults too, to problem solve on their own, to guide them with love and encouragement. Think about it, when a friend comes to you or a colleague comes to you with a problem, if you solve it for them, it's not their solve. It may not even be appropriate. You know the answer based on your experience, not on theirs. And with little kids, or even older kids, when there is a problem, whether it's a math problem or a problem with a relationship at home that they're trying to figure out, or a relationship on the play playground, or a behavior that they're having, if we give them the answer, here's what you need to do, it's not as meaningful. But if we guide them through a process so that they come up with their own answer, that's empowering. And it teaches them to be more responsible in the future. We also need to be able to maintain accountable behaviors as colleagues and for our students. We need to teach this, an accountability process. And part of teaching this accountability process has to do with teaching the difference between choice and mistake. Do you think about that? How many times does a kid make a poor choice, but just brush it off as a mistake. Even as adults, sometimes we do this. Oh, I made a mistake. Mistakes don't take our ownership, don't require ownership. Mistakes just happen. Choices require ownership. When something requires ownership, then you can choose differently next time. But a mistake, if it's brushed off with an excuse, it can repeat itself again and again because it's not my fault. It's just a mistake. Does that make sense to everybody? So if we are working and interacting specifically with kids, we want to make sure that they understand the difference between those two words. We need to help them to use the word choice to empower them to make healthy choices and responsible choices as opposed to choices that might lead to negative consequences. Okay? We want to also teach them the ripple effect of their choices. What might happen if you do that? I want you to think about the impact on other people before you make the choice. Then your choices are more meaningful, powerful. What, with all of these competencies, okay, let's, let's go back and review them. Self-awareness, self-management, 
right? Social awareness, relationship skills or relational skills, and responsible decision making. With all of them, a lot of teachers that feel like this is another program, it's a curriculum. You're going to tell us we have to do SEI. And we give you a program to do it. And it's one more thing on my plate. I don't know if in your roles you feel that way, do you? Does anybody feel like I can't do one more thing sometimes? Not as much. Okay, that's good for me to hear. But I also want you to know this. Social, there are curriculums that are out there, ways for people to teach social emotional learning that, that they're using in Washoe County that are phenomenal, that work well in schools. There are all sorts of different curriculums. But if we don't start with the way we be, then those curriculums mean nothing. And the way we be, I know the grammar doesn't sound right, but I'm using it intentionally. The way we be with one another, with our students, that's what really begins to teach. And that doesn't add anything more to our plates. It's just who we are, how we be. And it starts really with modeling. And this is an example of modeling for responsible decision making, but I want you to remember that we can model in our realm of education, whatever role we play, we can model each of these competencies every single day. Here's a modeling for responsible decision making. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem. Please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. Okay, oops, sorry. I want to give you some context. Sorry. This is Mo Cheeks is a professional basketball coach. He was, when this happened, this is a... Uh, the beginning of a basketball game. He was the coach, God bless you, of the Portland Trailblazers. Okay, so you're seeing this little girl singing the national anthem, and the, the modeling is by Mo Cheeks. And now to honor America and salute the men and women serving our country with our national anthem. Please welcome, as voted by you, the fans, our winner of the Toyota Get the Feeling of a Star promotion, Natalie Gilbert. She got stronger. 
And his modeling not only empowered her, but what did it do to the rest? Yeah! The everybody, the stands, but the opposite coach, the athletes. That was a big night for all of them, but they were all in that moment with that little girl. What we do, how we act, makes an incredible impact on our kids. We can say that self-management is important, or that responsible decision-making is important, or relationship skills are important. But if we don't model that they're important, if we don't act like they're important, our words are meaningless. The way we be makes a difference. You guys do PDIS. Yes, we do. Are you all aware of PBIS? Yes. PBIS is a multi-tiered system of support that basically says this. There are certain things that we do in regard to our way of being that we do for everyone, all kids. When it comes to social emotional learning, some of those universal ways of being in the green there for all kids are, are some of the things that we talked about in that keynote. Being loved, being connected, also being character, doing the right thing for the right reasons. Being restorative, we talked about that a little bit, and being invested in what we do. Those ways of being, we are for everyone. Being able to model SEL competencies, that should be for everyone. Modeling language around character, trustworthiness, responsibility, and then explicitly teaching. It doesn't matter what your role is. You have opportunities to teach kids the power of choice. You have opportunities to teach kids how to um, problem solve or solution find, whatever your realm is, or to work with your colleagues in the same way. And then there are tier two behaviors that are actually like small group probably behaviors where we target some kids, not all kids. What a lot of people think is that these are levels and once you get tier one, if you're not responding, like if a kid's really a discipline problem and you've loved on them and you've connected with them and you've taught social emotional learning, but, but the kid's still acting out, then he jumps to tier two. I want you to see the green continues to go around. Our way of being, that doesn't go away when a kid has more needs. He or she might get more intervention, but it doesn't mean that our way of being goes away. And even if a student jumps to a, a need for tier one intervention, that student still should be receiving all that we be. Okay, in the realm of social emotional learning. Putting it into practice, that's what we're going to do next. We're going to look at next. I want to give you some strategies under each competency. And I want you to talk in groups about what those strategies look like in your realm, in your world. I, I, I'm hoping we can group in like three groups maybe to have some discussions based on your role in education. But let me just review them really quickly. In regard to self-awareness, some strategies have to do with helping kids put words to feelings. Encouraging students to notice. I, one of the first things I said to you in that keynote is notice. How does your body feel right now? You may not have even thought about it if I didn't ask you to notice. We can ask our kids to notice, especially when we see that they're frustrated or angry. Notice what your body's telling you right now. I didn't realize my fists were clenched. Let's take a deep breath and see if you can relax those a little bit so that we can talk about what's really going on here. You know, noticing. It might start with breathing. Teachers are starting to implement meditation and breathing into the beginning of what they do in their classrooms. If you're a para and you're working in the classrooms and the teacher's not doing that, maybe it's something you can bring, contribute to that class. Providing students with an emotional rating scale. 
if you're working with kids and you're the first person they see, if you're an administrative assistant, and you might be the first person who sees that kid who's late almost every single day, maybe you work out something with that kid where you say, show me your number. You, you, you and the kid have talked about the fact that if he's a one, he's really having a tough day. He's really sad or angry or upset. And if he's a five, it's a good day. And anything in between. And you've already designed that process with the kid. But when they come in and they're checking in and you're the one they see, hey, show me your number. Okay, we're going to talk at lunch. Or well, five, good. Go have a great day. Go tackle it. You know what I'm saying? There are things that we can do regardless of our realm. Identifying student strengths and expressing belief in those strengths, we talked about that. Encouraging students to develop self-efficacy, to develop stick to itiveness. Made up that word, but I really like it. Stick to it. Sometimes they don't know how to do that. Teach them to persevere. To reflect on negative feelings and acknowledge them as opportunities to grow or to change or to learn and to set and achieve goals. Those are strategies under self-awareness. Strategies under self-management. Meeting kids right where they are by seeing that invisible backpack. Using this term, tell me more. If you, if you are connecting with a kid or a colleague who's upset, and you say something like, why did you? The wall's going to go up. They're going to get defensive. They're going to assume that they're in trouble or they're not going to be understood. But if you use the term, tell me more, tell me more about what's going on here, what you're feeling. Even tell me more about why you did that. A kid is going to assume, or an adult, that you want to hear more, that you're not going to automatically judge. It's a valuable strategy. Encourage students to notice feelings and physical manifestation of feelings, because if they notice them, they can do something about it. The power of choice we talked about. Allowing students to have feelings connected to failure, and then letting that failure serve as a self-motivator. Kids will freak out when you say, actually, it's a great thing that you didn't get it right this time. Because it just gives us an opportunity to work on it in a way that you'll better understand, so you can get it right next time. Have any of you seen, or do you guys show in any of your PD, uh, Every Child Deserves a Champion with Rita Pearson? Okay, write that down. Go on to YouTube and put in Rita Pearson. That's all you need to put in. Every Child Deserves a Champion. She has passed away now, an amazing human being and, and teacher. And she used to celebrate, she talks about celebrating plus two. You got a plus two out of 20. The kid's saying, but didn't I fail? No! You got a plus two. You're almost there. You're on your way. Let's celebrate that. You know? Um, I don't know if any of you were in schools where they use silent spaces or, or peace corners or peace places, but something that we can do is in our realm, in our world of education, we can create a place where a kid can go to de-escalate, to breathe, to know that they're not in trouble. Not that whatever they're doing might not come with consequences later, but in that moment that they can be and breathe. I always encourage like a sand timer for whatever space you create so that there are expectations set for this is a silent place. You get to go in, just turn that timer. And then while that sand's running, take your breaths. Close your eyes. Think about something peaceful, something pleasant, something that you want to look forward to. And then when the, the timer's out, come on out and let's talk about it. Or come on back, not out like you're in a place that's bad. We always want it to have positive connotations. Okay? All right. With social awareness, 1020 we have to help, correct? We're going to work together here in a minute. Social awareness. We gotta encourage kids to see the inside. We can do that in a variety of ways. I, I use my sister's story often. 
sharing your own stories, sharing stories of people you know or relatives are always ways to, ways to draw people in. If you don't have a story to tell, being able to share a book with a kid, wonder, it's an amazing book that helps kids to see the inside. It's also a movie. Tell a kid, go home and watch Wonder, and then let's talk about it tomorrow, you know, if it's not something you can do at school. Um, providing opportunities for students to share talents, customs, or family traditions. If you are working with a team at school, whether you're an administrative assistant or a para or you know, in the lunchroom or what have you, if you could be part of a team to develop a family night where kids get to bring a meal that is special to their own family culture or tradition, what a way to celebrate. I love that. You guys do that? And our school has flags from that all the countries that our that, students are from. That is so important. We put it on the wall. Yeah, and that's that, that seeking to understand and empowering the strengths that come from where you come from, where you come from, where you come from. We need to celebrate that in acceptance and, and with cultural humility. We also need to acknowledge that we all have implicit biases. You guys know what I mean by implicit bias? People say, I'm not judgmental. I really try hard not to be judgmental. I'm not judging. We all judge. All of us. We don't mean to. We don't necessarily want to. But it's human nature. We judge each other. And we often judge based on what we do not know or understand. So when we're judging, we don't realize it, that's an implicit bias. We're making an assumption about someone else. It's not because we have hate in our hearts or because we're intentionally trying to demean someone. That would be bias, assertive bias, aggressive bias, obvious bias. Implicit bias is, I don't even realize I'm doing it, but I'm doing it. That's where we need to be culturally humble. Another strategy for social awareness is modeling empathy, modeling acceptance, creating opportunities for acceptance and empathy. Serving others is a great way to model and to build social awareness. Relationship skills, practicing the seven keys to connection, figuring out a way that you can create a daily routine for greeting, using tell me more, seeking to understand, all of these ways, the overlaps, the circles that overlap in the beginning when we talk about competencies, they're there for a reason. They overlap because they're all connected. And responsible decision making, again, it comes down to modeling, talking about the power of choice, providing opportunities for kids to make choices, and little kids use limited choices. Rather than making a decision for them, let them know that you can do this or you can do this. Which do you choose? That way, you regulate it better. When I was a middle school teacher, and you had kids that were always on the power play, wanted to prove, you know, that they were better than the teacher, they were funnier, they were in charge, it was a huge difference between saying, you need to stop saying that, you need to stop saying that, you need to stop saying that, or I'm going to send you to the principal, to say, here's the deal, bud. You choose to be respectful in my classroom, you take a walk down the principal. What do you want to do? All right. I'll be respectful. I mean, seriously, I know it sounds simple, but for middle school students that were all about power, I just gave that kid an opportunity to maintain his power. Because he got to choose to be respectful. You know? It's, it, it's amazing. Yeah, but you know what? When I was a middle school teacher, my kids were two and three and four. You know? It worked with them the same way. It's awesome. Um, teaching kids the accountability process, and if you can make it a school-wide process, but that idea of checking out the hand, we always want to blame someone else. There's three, three fingers pointing back at us. It's a strategy to teach them that, to look at their impact on other people. To set expectations for consistent investment in an accountability process. If you're going to have a process, we've got to use the process. We gotta have high expectations for all kids. I always told my kids, and it doesn't matter the realm of influence. If you have low expectations for people, they'll meet them. If you have high expectations, they'll meet them too. So why not set them high? And then celebrate when they meet them. 
A lot of kids in schools, I know in Washoe County with PBIS, use check-in and check-out forms. In your role, if you're not the teacher, or you're not a special ed teacher or a paraprofessional either that, that even that works directly with these forms, you can still be asking kids, how'd you do with your check-in and check-out today? They're aware of it. If you're going to help them to set goals, check in with them about it. All right. Now, you've been sitting a long time. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up when I say, you can listen, move around a little bit. And I want you to try to group. Actually, I don't know if we have enough of you that are with. Like, how many? Raise your hand if you interact directly with kids every single day in every part of your day. OK. So I want, out of that group, I want you guys to stand up. And I want you to form, come up here and give back to back in two groups. <laughs> two groups. So come on up if that's you. And I want you to give back to back in two groups. So it's up in two groups. The rest of you, I want you to come here in a group. OK? Back to back. Back to back, just because that's a way to kind of get yourself a little closer. Back to back, come here, All right, please. So, and, so you guys are like, like all of you, back to back, like a circle back to back. So are you, you guys are all together. OK, I want you two over there with them. Okay, wait a minute. Are you guys the people? No, you're the people that are working with kids. So it was just you. Okay, come back. I'm sorry. I'm going to scream you guys this way. Okay. So you're a group, and you're a group. And you're a group. Well, it's okay. All I was trying to do is gather you. So it could have been a circle back to back. It could have, I just wanted to see total numbers. So I'm just trying to gather you. Now, you guys all came in together, right? You know each other? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put you here and you there. And I'm going to move you here and you there. Okay. So, you guys are a group. You guys are a group. And you guys are a group. Here's what you're going to do. These strategies, and you guys are a group, these strategies that we just reviewed are going to be your point of discussion. And I'm going to give you guys a bigger group, so I'll let you share too. In each group, I want you to pick a leader, a table leader. So you're going to go sit around the table and feel free to pull them apart so you can all group together. Mm -hmm. Each group is going to pick a table leader. That's the person that's going to be in charge of making sure that everybody contributes, everybody talks. That person's going to say, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Okay? Every table is going to have a recorder. So as you come up with things, I want somebody to jot them down. And then every group gets to volunteer somebody to be the presenter, to share what you come up with. Okay? I want your group to focus on self-awareness and self-management. Okay? I want your group and social awareness. I want your group to focus on relational skills because there's so much overlap. That's a big one. And responsible decision making. I want your group to focus on all of them in your realm because your eyes are going to be the lens of colleagues versus kids. Okay? Now, here's what you're going to do with your areas of focus. I want you to read together those strategies again. And then I want you to come up with, as a group, and you're going to come up with these things by each of you sharing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's all on the, on the board here. OK, I want you to come up with two strategies of each of the competencies. So you guys were given two. So you're going to come up with four all together, two out of responsible decision making and two out of relationships. So Come up with two strategies that you have seen in what you already do with kids to be impactful, to make a difference. 
You might even share a way in which it does. So I want you to talk about that. What do we know out of these things already works? We're already doing it. And we've seen it be powerful and impactful. I want you to share one thing that intrigues you. That as you heard about it, you're like, I don't do this, but I think this is something I could do. I understand it, I get it, and I want to put it into practice. And then finally, if as you read through your competencies that have been assigned to you, if you have a question, a particular question like, you say this, but I don't really get the how. I don't really get what this means. Then write down that question as a group. Now, as a group, you might talk about it all and decide you understand all of it. Okay? But I want to give you an opportunity to ask a question. Okay? So you're going to read through the competency, come up, talk about two strategies that you know really work. So it's going to take that table leader, making sure everybody has a voice to agree on two strategies that really work. One thing that intrigues you, one strategy that intrigues you that you want to try, and one question that you have. Do I have any questions? Okay, we're going to do this for about, we'll take probably, I think this is over at 10.20 and we want to share out. So let's take 15 to 20 minutes. I'll check in with you and see how you're doing on time. Okay, you guys go to that corner, you guys go to that corner, and you guys can come right up here. All right? Okay. You get to decide. First thing that you do when you sit with your group is decide who's the table leader, who's the recorder, and who is the presenter. And you guys might, you can, these tables are pretty light. You might be able to squish two tables together if you have a bigger group. All right. So we have five minutes left together is all. But I want you to learn from each other a little bit in regard what, to what you came up with that really works. So I'm going to start back here, and we're going to go around um, with the first thing. And that is, and instead of sharing out two, I want you to pick the one you talked about the most. So share out one strategy that you felt as a group was something that works well, that you've seen work well, make an impact. Go ahead. Uh, specifically, self-awareness. Okay. Um, we notice that they're all um, tied together with um, what we believe in. Um, one key, you know, part that we talked about was how you speak, tone of voice, you slow down, you think before you speak. So it, uh, not only do we have to do it as staff, but you know we have to promote that with the students and. Um, you know, lead into that path where they'll be self-aware of their surroundings, a lot of people's feelings. Um, and so if, if we can just get students to acknowledge that, it's, a, um, it, it's like an umbrella for many things to cover. Yes, absolutely. That's fantastic. And I love your connection to not only teaching them, but showing them by the way that we are. Yeah. That's fantastic. I know there's so much more to share. I'm going to come back to you guys. What's your strategy? One strategy that stands out. Okay, so what was mentioned in our group is smiling, 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 um, acknowledging that our students are beautiful and intelligent and capable. Um, this is for relationship skills, and I mean, so basically smiling and acknowledging our students that are and trying to be present with them, acknowledging that they are beautiful and they are intelligent and we value their strengths. So so you just said one thing. So Yeah, that's great. And and think about this. So for, yeah. We have to like smiling seems like, well, sh of course, everybody knows that. But we get so caught up we forget it. So it is a strategy, and it's one that we need to remind ourselves of all of the time. And when we forget, back it up and go, okay, I'm starting again, you know? That's beautiful. Thank you very much. And our kids are beautiful inside and out. To help them to, to value what's on the inside as much as what's on the outside is so important. Strategy for you guys. You focus primarily with colleagues. 
Uh, yeah, so we, we started with self-awareness and we talked a lot about how you don't have to have emotional rate and scale, but how it can be useful to check in at you know, the beginning of your day, oh yeah, how should we can, and it's rapport building and relationship building, yes. um, and it can start you off on the right foot and make people also acknowledge that you care about them. Um, and then if you can combine it with goal setting, it can make you more effective for the day where others can be more effective when they have to exercise that choice and say, oh, I had a really bad weekend and I didn't sleep very well, so I'm gonna do this today instead of that. Yeah, and you oh, understand that. that's okay. so powerful. And not just with colleagues, but with students too. If we take time to check in, think about staff meetings. You go to a staff meeting, you get right down to business, all people are thinking about is when is this going to be over? But if you go to a staff meeting and everybody, you do a one word check in, really quick, one word that describes your day today. Boom, 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 boom. Even if that word is negative, you can always, you know, limited choices. One positive word that describes your, your day today. But everybody's seen and heard and acknowledged. People are more apt to engage. So I love the check in. And tying it to, uh, to a goal is phenomenal and works with kids as well. Um, really quick, something that intrigued you. I'm sorry that we can't do all the strategies. Something that intrigued you, and then you guys are going to do a question that you have. Uh, something that intrigued us about self-management. Uh, you choose. Or, yeah, well, self-management. Um, we're talking about you know, being kind and you know, empathy. Uh, but we're also talking about um, the respect at, uh, aspect of school, uh, having repercussions, uh, and then building confidence. So I work at SIP, so I have to focus a lot on this because um, there has to be a structure in a kid's uh, daily routine, and they have to be, you know, uh, self-management about coming to school, um, being on time, being respectful to others, um, and then you know you just get frustrated and you know teach them like how to calm down and take a break, break um, and that allow you to keep going instead of just completely shutting down for the entire day. Yeah. So the strategy that intrigues you is how do we get our kids to notice and be cognizant of that brain break, that need to breathe, taking three breaths, or going to that peace corner, doing what they need to do to reset. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay, what was a question that you guys had in all that you looked at? What stood out? Well, we didn't really get to that, but I have a question. So I'm okay. Gonna <laughs> so I've always been of the mindset that if a kid asks you how to do math problem, you sit down and you work with them and teach them how to do it. But like how does that work with adults? Mm -hmm. Because I'll have somebody, a colleague, come over and ask me a question, and I'll just give the answer, yeah. rather than getting up and going and showing them how yeah. to do it, because it's quicker, it's easier, and I don't want to make anybody just, just stop. stop. Yeah, just give in. Well, and you have to assess that. You have to assess, what's the attention? This is a self-awareness thing. What's the intention? Is this a very, very busy per, uh, person that really just needs an answer right now? Or is it somebody that's going to keep coming back to me and asking over and over and it's going to really benefit all of us if I work with them to learn how to do it together? So, so I think with a colleague, it's situational, you have to measure it, and then you might have to plan time to get together. So here's the deal, I'm going to give you that answer now, but can you meet with me next week? Let's, you know, let's, if you can come at 10 o'clock, I'll have coffee ready. I want, it'll only take 10 minutes, but I want to walk through this with you so you understand. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's a problem solving solution finding. Yeah. Same yeah. Thing, but yeah. I get it. I get it. We want to work with people so that we can all be self sufficient. You know? <laughs> okay. An intrigue or a question? What stands out most? Yes. I have one, and I've been going through it at school now. We tell the kids, we want you to give us respect, give us respect, give us respect. But then I'm watching teachers, I think respect, the easiest way to teach it is to do it. Mm -hmm. And so you're really great, and I give you this gift, and you're really great, and then I give you this. And at the end of the day, the rest of these kids in class were bad. So I gave you a free recess at the end. Oh, they were noisy, I'm taking it all away. And we're giving and taking, and giving and taking, mm -hmm. and they're learning, we lie. Yeah. You gave me something for being good, but then he was bad, so I'm taking it away from you. And then we're teaching them, our word means nothing, 
Yeah. But I expect you to always give me your word and hand me your word. I tell you a thousand mm -hmm. times, be respectful to me. But I can take away what I gave you, and then adults, if I gave you something, there's no way I'm taking it away. Yeah. But as children, we're giving them and taking, and giving them and taking. And they're learning. They don't have to be honorable either yeah. with their friends, with us. Yeah. And well, so and those kids, adults? those kids that are bad are the same kids that are bad the next time and the next yes, time and the next time. time because so we're not growing in our kids. We want to grow. She would so, not keep being really good because why? You're yeah. going to take it away from me later. Yeah. So how do we stop First that? thing I'm going to tell you is this. We have to remember we can only control what we can control. Mm -hmm. So the first way that you do that is by your own actions and your own mount modeling because you may not be able to have any control over that teacher you have to work with that continues to do that. You can model a different way in hopes that your modeling will rub off on that person. At the same time, if we can find opportunities maybe to have someone in authority to recognize this and be able to, to demonstrate that if we want kids to be respectful, we need to be respectful ourselves. And this is what you might ask us, someone in authority, can you show us and talk to us about what respect looks like? What does it look like? So that we're all on the same page. What are your, ask your administrator, what are your expectations for respect? And is there any way you can communicate that school-wide? Because what looks like respect to one person may not look the same. When I go into schools and do focus groups, kids and teachers all know that respect is important, but they don't know what it looks like. You know, so we need to talk about that. So increasing opportunities to talk about it and it might take, regardless of your role, asking for a one-on-one -on -one, um, meeting with your person, your supervisor, to be able to say, here's something that I'm seeing, and I really would like more information. Can you help with this? Yeah, this has a lot of power in what yes. teaching our children. Oh, big time. And when I talk to kids, let's just end on this note, when I talk to kids about respect, I always talk to them, like kids, it's a golden rule. What does it say? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Kids often see it, and some adults, as treat others as you're treated. So you'll hear kids say, I'm not respecting that teacher because she doesn't respect me or she doesn't respect me. And what I tell teenagers especially, you guys talked about this, is you just gave all your power away when you let one person determine how you act. I'm not acting a certain way because of what you just did to me. I just gave you all my power. Well, kids want power. They want to maintain it. So to help them be aware, and maybe if you're teaching this lesson to a kid, maybe that teacher will hear it as well, but help kids to be aware that you maintain power when you choose to be respectful. You know? A last thought, Thomas Jefferson said, I will treat you like a gentleman, not because you are one, but because I am. Yeah, remember that. All right, you guys, thank you so much. Kind of read this on your way out and maybe give yourself a um, goal. Give yourself a goal.